What is up, everyone? My name is Lauren Wilson. I am an Arizona School of Ministry student, so getting my pastoral license. I will be done with schooling at the end of 2024, so we have August, September, October, November, December, five more months of schooling. And my goal is not to be a traditional pastor. I believe in being a vocational pastor pastor, which means I, I work in a different setting. However, I am a resource to really just go after truth. I never want to force a belief system or a value system on anybody. My goal is to create opportunities to have constructive conversations where we openly and safely talk about some of the toughest questions that we face, one, why are we here? What's the purpose of this weird journey called life? How do we go about maximizing our time on this earth? What makes a life well lived? And then from there, just just doing the best that we can. And so for me, it's can we work out together? Can we go on camping trips together? Can we just live life and then have these deeper spiritual conversations because we both agree that having some sort of spiritual discipline will lead to a higher quality of life. And so today what I really want to dive into is in the Western world. So I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. So in the Western world, we when we go to school, we're taught to think and thus perceive the world and perceive problems in the world through a very specific lens. A lot of it is we're presented facts, and then we regurgitate those facts. We're not really taught to think necessarily critically, and we're definitely not taught, unless you go to a private school, how to, how to think through a theological in a philosophical lens. And so when we when we feel this calling or we feel this yearning to go deeper in our spiritual walk, we're going to be biased towards text and towards narratives and towards stories that match the perceptual lens that we were taught and trained to think through. And the reason I bring that up is because in my own journey trying to wrestle with the Christian Bible and the Christian text, it is really hard. I have three college degrees. I have my MBA, pass all four parts of the CPA exam, which is one of the hardest standardized tests to pass. I have numerous certifications. I've pretty much been in school almost my entire life only th since I'm 33, about to be 34, since I started school at age five, I've only been out of school for three years. A lot of that has been night school over the last decade or so. And when I read the Bible, I think it's hard. I think it's confusing. And it wasn't really until I got mentors and I dug deeper on YouTube and asked pastors and asked people that had been to seminary school how do you study this? How do you think in this way? Did the stories in the text really start to resonate with me on a deeper level? I was I was just super confused. I didn't understand the different genres of the text. I didn't understand how a, how a story was constructed. I didn't understand poetry or metaphors or literal historical facts. And so my goal for this video today is to go through a paper that we had to write in school based on Michael J. Gorman's book, Elements of Biblical Exegesis. And so exegesis is how do we study a text? And so I want to go ahead and let me show you what that book is. And so this, this is the book that we had to read early on in the School of Ministry curriculum. And again, this really allowed me to go deeper in terms of studying the biblical text and the and the canonical text because it taught me how to oh this was the type of literary genre it is this was the historical context of this text etc and so writing the paper on that I'm just going to read my paper pause as feels natural 
and kind of go from there. And again, this is to help hopefully develop the the thinking framework to attack the text, to wrestle with the text, and from there, being able to actually enjoy the text rather than reading it and just being confused. Like, I know that I was the first time that I read the New Testament, and especially the Old Testament, I still, even after diving into the book and, and diving into courses over the last two years, the Old Testament still confuses me. And and if you talk to pastors that have been in it, there's a scripture in Hebrews that says the word is alive and it's sharper than a two-edged sword and it pierces your heart. Something along those those lines. Let me let me Google it real quick for us. So Hebrews scripture is alive. Cause so I want you to see it of what it says. So let me share my screen. It's Hebrews 4.12. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so what this scripture is saying is the word is alive and active. So we know some of the attributes of God. God is immutable, which means he has been the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. He has never changed. But the thing is, is God is infinite, and we are not. We are finite. So for God to present his attributes and his character to us through revelation, he had to do it over time so that the way that we finitely process information that we could actually do it. And so when we read the word, the word itself, God's attributes and character don't change. Our orientation to it changes as we gain more life experience and as our context changes as well. And then the word talks to our souls and it cuts through it like a double edged sword. And so again, confusing, but exegesis is just one way to to go deeper into our understanding and therefore deepen our relationship with God. So let me go ahead and and dive into the paper. So this is almost like a spark notes version of the elements of exegesis. And so I wrote the author Michael Gorman begins the text by laying out a more broad general definition of exegesis before narrowing into the seven step process he has refined during his career/ slash experience. The broad general explanation given of exegesis directly from the text is a word deriving from the Greek word Greek verb to lead out refers to the careful historical, literary, and theological analysis and explanation of a text. It may also be described as close reading. Michael shortens this to, in a nutshell, exegesis asks two questions. What? And so what? To paraphrase, exegesis is a method of studying a text with the goals of not only gaining a better understanding of the text, but also a deeper understanding of the importance of that text within a society. If you begin your exegesis discipline by deciphering what this latter statement even means, you begin to realize the depth of exegesis. What does understanding even mean? What is the goal of understanding anything. Why has this particular text, the Bible, in understanding been a central topic of debate for thousands of years? What makes something important enough to even seek understanding it? Michael does his best to put bounds on this depth through defining a seven-step process so that we may start to engage in the practice of exegesis. The seven elements of Michael Gorman's exegesis process are as follows. Step one, survey, preparation for reading or introduction. Step two, contextual analysis of the text's historical and literary context, canonical context, right? So survey is a, is a preparation for reading. What is, what is my state of mind? What is the book? that I'm reading? Why am I even reading it? What is the goal of reading it? What am I trying to abstract through wrestling with this text? What is the 
cultural significance currently and historically? What is the text historical and literary context? So can I put myself into the history of the book, into the BC era or into AD 50, into the characters or the author's shoes? What is the literary context? Is it poetry? Is it hymns? Is it history? Is it metaphor? Is it symbolism? And then the canonical context. So there's over 45,000 different Christian denominations. Protestants believe in the 66 books. Other denominations believe in 73 books. And again, I'm not here to force a worldview on you. That's for you to wrestle with. But where in those books does this book sit? Right? Is it book one? Is it book 30? Is it book 40? Why does it sit there? And where does it sit? And what is the significance of where it is sequentially? Formal analysis, this is step three, formal analysis of the text's form, structure, and movement. So what is the sentence structure? What is the paragraph structure? Is it parallel? Does it repeat itself? Is it repeating a theme uh, just within the same book over and over? Or is it repeating a, a theme that's consistent throughout the canonical text? Is it a revelation of God's attribute or is it a lesson that we're trying to to learn from the character detailed analysis synthesis so taking all this information and starting to abstract or come to conclusions that can be tested against from your peers right so peer reviewed so once you decide you extract all this information you come up with your thoughts where it can stand up to the scrutiny from your peers reflection after you you set your analysis aside for a second can you reflect on all of it after a week after a month can you come back to it in a year and and are your thoughts the same and then e expansion and refinement so again, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active. So this exegesis process isn't a one-time thing. You go through, you wrestle with the text, you analyze the text, you talk with people with different worldviews from different cultures. What do they think? You test it. You experientially test it. And in conversations, and then you come back to it when you're different, when your life experience is different, when you've had more conversations and you read it, and you re-wrestle with it, and you continue to refine. And so then, c carrying on in my paper, these seven elements of exegesis take into account an analytic approach as well as an engaged approach. So analytic being, we analyze it from the traditional Western education system perspective, where we're going to critically think and look at this, look at the literary features, look at the historical features, and have peer-reviewed science with it. And then the engaged approach is I take what the story tells me and I act out in the world what I believe it means. So experiential knowledge, the deepest form of knowing something is to embody it. An analytical approach, so going back to my paper, an analytical approach is what one might consider a more modern-day rational approach to analyzing a text with an emphasis of importance placed on the historical context and literary style rather than the emotional valence of the text. An engaged approach puts more emphasis on the emotional valence, that is, the individual's personal relationship with the text. Through this personal relationship, a transformation occurs through embodiment and actualization of the text. Michael leans his exegesis process towards guiding others in the engaged approach. So you so you think about it for a second. All of your memories, are they rational facts, cold, or are they emotional moments? The time you won the award, the time you fell in love, the time you got that job, the time you lost that job, the time you had the finances, the time you lost the finances, the time you had heartbreak, the time you had the adventure of your life. Do you remember cold, rational facts or do you remember stories and how they made you feel and then how those stories 
transformed you in the moment and over time. And so that's what the engaged approach is, is I take these stories that are embodiments of certain attributes. And so let's say you're not ready to call it the inspired word of God. View it this way. This is what's helped me. Why these stories? These stories have been around for over 2,000 years. The Old Testament has been around 5,000, 6,000 years. It was an oral narrative form. Why did human beings choose to select these stories to pass down? And why have they survived the test of time? What is it about these specific stories and how they orient themselves to the human condition? Why have we continued to preserve them? And why do they speak to the deepest parts of our souls? And, and, and when you abstract these lessons, why do they transform people from all different cultures, from all different backgrounds, all different races, all different socioeconomic statuses? The old argument that Christianity and religion was used to control the mob, used to control the masses, that no longer holds true. So what is it? Why won't these stories go away? And why do they help people break addiction? Why do they help people secure meaning and purpose? And why have they been preserved? And so going on in my paper, I personally believe that Michael has done a good job of laying out a plan for how to perform exegesis. And I agree on his description of exegesis. I too and bias towards the engaged approach or one's personal relationship with the text and how this relationship transforms you through embodiment of the text itself. And then I even wrote in the paper from Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God does not change. His attributes are immutable and non-changing. What does that mean then? Is that for the word to be active, which implies movement, it has to have a medium for which it to move through and be active. And that medium is us. We as finite fallen humans are constantly changing. We are oftentimes ruled by our instinctual, emotional, and rational brains and often ignore the meta-consciousness that transcends us the Holy Spirit, our perceptions of the world, and thus the word of God in relation to our perception is what changes, not the actual word itself. One's current state will change how the word affects them, how one's heart is aligned in that moment. I believe that this embodiment of the word and how it transforms you in relation to you is the truest form of truth there is. Truer than any historical context or literary style, the effect something has on your personal physiological and psychological state in the immediate moment, however, most importantly in the context of well-being over time, is the most important form of truth there is. Oftentimes, we cannot express these truths with words, which is why art and music is so valuable in our society. It captures through embodiment what words alone cannot Describe. However, there's a degree of importance on the historical and literary context of a text as well. This context is especially important to consider when one goes about wrestling with the harder questions within the Bible that do not align with what some would say is modern day consensus of morality, such as the mass killings of people, the deaths of firstborns, how to treat your slaves, homosexuality is a sin, or the incest that occurs in the Bible. If we as Christians believe that the word of God is truth or logos, this implies we believe that all of the word is integral to our very being or existence. If we struggle with our engagement exegesis style to comprehend, reconcile these events in the Bible, then we must be equipped with other tools of analysis to try to change our relationship with perception of the text. We have to be careful with the engagement method of exegesis not to fall into confirmation and other forms of bias. Focusing only on those aspects of the word and the attributes lessons that are soothing. 
We have to wrestle with the harder aspects as well, which may take other tools of analysis than a purely engaged approach, which is why the ability to use the analytical exegesis approach is paramount. And so again, you're, this isn't going to solve it in a 15 to 20 minute YouTube video. However, I think the most important thing to realize is, one, it's okay to struggle with reading the Bible. It's been thousands and thousands of years. There's over 45,000 different Christian denominations. There's tons of other religions. I think that to not wrestle and to pretend like you understand everything that the book says and everything that the book is trying to communicate to us, I think that's naive and I think it's immature. I think that the humble approach in say, I believe this is this is what it is. Here's the literary context. Here's the historical context. And here is my own human experience and transformation from the text and you talk with your fellow peers that is one way of going about it and then a second second note is these stories again have been around for thousands of years why what is it about these stories and their relation or their orientation to the human condition that makes them so valuable and last outlast civilizations, outlast countries, outlast kings, outlast rock, stone, iron, these stories, these books. What is it? I think that is a question worth wrestling with, and I believe that if you continue down the road of truth, that you will be transformed, and you will have an embodiment of that answer. And again, don't be too hard on yourself. We weren't taught to think through this theological and philosophical lens. However, until you recognize that, until you recognize that you lacking that skill, like I did, the stories will always be confusing. And so you have to keep your rational mind because logic is very important. However, understand that there's different aspects of truth, such as emotional, abstraction, metaphor, and the engaged approach, or your own life experience, your inputs and outputs of life based on your thoughts and your actions and your experiences, and learning to think theologically. And lastly, I'll leave with, I'll leave with this, though. With regards to the New Testament, according to our own peer-reviewed Western science. Very, 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 very few people doubt that Jesus was a real person, that he walked this earth, that he had followers, and that the tomb was empty, and that there was disciples, and that there was apostles who started the Christian church, and these ideas and these stories gripped the souls of, of millions of people, billions of people now, over thousands of years. You can say that the Roman Empire persecuted people and forced it upon people, but that doesn't really fit the bill because now in a free society, we don't have to believe anything, and they still exist to these days. And why would the disciples die for something like this? Why would they die for these for these stories? Why would they be crucified? Especially Apostle Paul, who was a high-ranking Jewish official. He had earthly riches. He had power. He even persecuted and murdered Christians, and he gave it all up. And we know this, this is a historical fact. He gave it all up to be an apostle, start the Christian church, be persecuted, be stoned, be thrown in prison, be shipwrecked, and then crucified or executed why those are questions worth exploring and those are questions worth asking and then finally how do we know anything how do you believe anything any fact that you take for granted how do we know abe lincoln was real how do we know george washington was real how do we know the roman empire was real 
Did you see it? Or do you trust authority? Do you trust culture? What a teacher told you. Or do you wrestle with the truth and come to your own conclusions? And so I'm not saying to believe a certain thing or to value a certain thing. All I'm asking, because I've wrestled with this myself, I ask myself, why do I believe what I believe? I haven't seen any of these people. Why do I have trust in the authorities I have trust? Why do I believe the sources of information that I believe in? And at the end of the day, I believe that the engaged approach is the most real approach. That is, we abstract something, we act it out or embody it, and we see what happens. And from my own personal experience, when I read the Christian Bible, when I worship God, when I practice love, service, when I repent, when I practice forgiveness of myself and of others, when I pray, I feel the fruit of the Spirit. I feel more love. I feel more joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And so if that is real to me, and I know that Jesus was, or I believe based off a historical authority that Jesus was a real person who walked the earth and the tomb was empty, and these apostles wrote these books on the early church and the concepts of the gospel, and everything that I practice in the book, worship, prayer, fellowship, service, humbleness, forgiveness, leads to the fruit of life and human flourishing. Why would I doubt the parts that seem like miracles and seem like mythology and then what is miracles and what is mythology and if something as powerful can create everything we see the universe the earth why would that same force that same creative force not be capable of miracles that the finite brain can't typically comprehend with its rational logic Maybe something transcends or supersedes rational logic. And maybe that's what faith is. Maybe faith doesn't sit underneath rational logic in terms of its value. Maybe faith transcends and sits above rational logic. And, and I'll leave it with this. that We know for a fact that 40% of the efficacy of pharmaceutical drugs is the placebo effect, that our belief in something manifests the, more, the mere result. About 30 to 40 percent of pharmaceutical drugs is placebo effect. And so with that, does faith supersede rationality? Because we have faith in culture. We have faith in capitalism. We have faith in authority. And that's how we derive most of the truths that help us navigate this life. And so why, when it comes to these specific stories, is there more contention? Is there more conscious thought on doubt? Something interesting. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, would, I would be kidding. This is where I'm at with my faith. I have no problem with the idea of God. Everything makes sense to me that there is a God. Jesus being God, that is something that's very hard for my rational, logical brain that was raised in the Western world to comprehend. However, that's where, that's where I'm at now, is that a God that is spirit, embodied love at the highest level, sacrificial innocent love and spilt the blood because a price had to be paid for our imperfections and us falling short or infinite justice and infinite mercy and infinite love all wrapped up into one moment that makes sense to me but it's scary because if it's true what are the actual ramifications of that what does it mean to actually have faith and to believe and to spend eternity with God 
or away from God. So thank you for listening this far, fellow truth seekers. I love you, and I can't wait to continue to go on this journey with you. If you got something out of this, please hit that subscribe button. Please let a friend know about the channel, and let's not stop growing together. Love y'all.